It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of His Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. Good morning. This question is for the Premier. Speaker, the closer you look at the government's Ontario Place scheme, the worse it gets. Yesterday, we revealed a previously unknown phase two of the project that even involves a plan to fill in parts of Lake Ontario to build a, quote, large-scale entertainment centre. While the minister tried to brush this off, she didn't directly deny it. So I want to hear from the Premier. Does he plan to fill in parts of Lake Ontario for this vanity project, yes or no? To reply, the Minister of Infrastructure. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I'm so sorry. I'm just trying to catch my breath here. Speak slow this we time. announced uh, $3 billion for infrastructure today yeah. with the Premier yeah. and the Minister of Finance. As part of the 2024 budget, I'm very happy to see that happen. Mr. Speaker, let me be very clear. There is no phase two. There is no paving of the Brigantine Cove. What we decided to do, Mr. Speaker, was instead to expand the public realm space to 50 acres. We're building a brand new stage, wellness facility, park, and as well a new science center, marina, and food and beverage on the site. That is what we showed to the public in April. That is what we are constructing today. Very good. <laughs> Supplementary question. Speaker, I got to tell you, that's not going to be good enough for a lot of Ontarians because this government has hidden these plans. They've, they've refused to answer the questions and be straightforward with people. Um, and you have to wa really wonder why they decided to hide these details. Yesterday, the minister said over and over and over again that the government only plans to move the science uh, centre to Ontario Place. They only came up with that plan in 2023. Today, the official opposition is sharing more documents that show the plans to relocate the Science Centre were already in motion in January of 2020. That's three full years before the plans were announced to the public. We need some transparency from the Premier today. When exactly did the government decide to move the Science Centre, and why did they hide it from the public? Mr. Infrastructure. Mr. Speaker, years ago, and I remember a member from Ottawa was with us, where we clearly said that we wanted science-related programming on this site, Mr. Speaker, and that's when we started exploring the idea of bringing the Science Centre to Ontario Place. Mr. Speaker, the AG justified everything that we have said, that it would be less expensive for government to build a brand new facility with 10,000 more square feet of exhibition space. Mr. Speaker, sure. Mr. Speaker, what's most exciting sure. is that Ontarians will finally have an Ontario place the that they can enjoy nice for years to come. Yeah. Here, here. Final supplementary. Speaker the, ministers, Speaker, the minister's timeline keeps changing, and that's what happens when you make major infrastructure decisions in the shadows and the back rooms. The government had already decided on this plan more than a year and a half before they announced that Thermo won the contract. The documents we uncovered appear to show the undisclosed attraction plan for Ontario Place has the exact same footprint as Thermo's proposal. Quite a coincidence. So, Speaker, did the government give preferential treatment to Therma for its luxury spa proposal? Members will please take their seats. Minister of Infrastructure. Mr. Speaker, I'm happy to repeat myself again. 2019, we did a call for development where we encouraged people to participate in the process. In 2021, we picked our partners, which is Therma and Live Nation. And in April of 2023, Mr. Speaker, we presented the whole vision of Ontario Place, which, include a which included a brand new stage, 50 acres of public realm space, wellness and water park Sounds provided beautiful. by Thermae, and a brand new science centre, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, we have been fully transparent with the public throughout this entire process. We have consulted with close to 10,000 people throughout wow. this process. But again, what is most important is that a site that was forgotten about Fall by apart. the Liberal government will now come to life Rusty. and be a site that families and Ontarians can enjoy for generations. Great work. Great work. Thank you. The next question. Once again, the Leader of the Opposition. 
Speaker, this project involves vital public land on Toronto's waterfront and hundreds of millions of dollars of public money. People deserve to know how that money is being spent and who's going to benefit, so I am going to keep asking. Last year, the Premier confirmed that his family friend, Carmen Negro, was negotiating a mysterious sole source agreement with Ontario Live. Ontario Live happens to be run by another family friend, Zlatko Starkovsky. What is the relationship between the secret Ontario Live agreement and the secret Phase 2 plan for Ontario Place? Minister of Infrastructure. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, part of what she said was right, Mr. Speaker. This is vital <laughs> uh, lands, which is why we as a government decided to finally build something That's on right. these lands that families can enjoy. Exactly. The Liberals closed the site. Um, of course, there's Trillium Park, but the rest of the site is deteriorating. It is flooding to the degree that Live Nation actually had to close down their shows in 2017. That's a shame. And that is acceptable to the NDP, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. It is yeah. not acceptable to us. We have a vital asset on the waterfront that is not being used. We are building attractions on the site so that families can enjoy the site once again. Beautiful. <laughs> Supplementary question? Public land, public money, Ford family friends. That's, right. yeah. That's how it all connects. Speaker, people shouldn't have to make freedom of information requests to find out about a major infrastructure project happening with their money. People shouldn't need a chart of the Premier's friends and family to find out who is securing sole source contracts. Right? Who we need this Premier and this minister to come clean about this project. So to what extent were these deals made to ben benefit the Premier and his personal friends? Members take their seats. Minister of Infrastructure. Mr. Speaker, in 2019, when the gov government announced that we wanted to bring Ontario Place back to life, what did we do? We had a public procurement process, a competitive process, where parties participated. And the outcome of that process in 2021 was the selection of two partners, Live Nation and Thermae, to build the wellness facility and the water park. Mr. Speaker, we have kept the public apprised of this project the whole way. We have spoken about this project Order. almost on a daily basis in the legislature, Mr. Speaker, and we will continue to project. keep the, pu the public apprised of our pro progress. In fact, we just wrapped up a consultation with marina operators. We are planning on rebuilding and revitalizing the marina, making it a more inclusive Beautiful. marina. Even better. Response. We have every intention to bring food and beverage on the site because we know families with children, they need to have a drink and they need Absolutely. to have food for, the, for their children and have ice cream on the site. And that is how we are proceeding, Mr. Speaker. Just keeps getting... And the final supplementary. So let me get this straight. The secret sole source deal for Ontario Order. Place was negotiated by two Ford family friends. Order. A private luxury spa company got a taxpayer-funded parking lot that was not offered to other bidders. The government had to change the laws so they could force this government and force this project through without being taken to court. How can this shady deal proceed, Speaker, considering this government is already under investigation by the RCMP? Going to caution the Leader of the Opposition on her choice of words. To reply, the Minister of Infrastructure. Mr. Speaker, with the vision that we shared in April of 2023, the announcement, which her colleagues attended, Christmas the there. public attended, the whole press gallery attended, Mr. Speaker, we anticipate to have approximately or up to 6 million visitors a year. Amazing. We want to make the site as accessible to the public as possible, whether they're cycling, walking, taking public transit because of our subway expansion plan, 
the Ontario line will connect to Ontario Place, but we also need to have a parking option for families. Order. We know that seniors and families, women with children, Order. will likely drive to the site, and we want it to be as accessible for families to enjoy. Mr. Speaker. Opposition, come to order. Mr. Speaker, as part of the new deal with the City of Toronto, we will continue to work with the City on, on the parking option Response. to make sure that parking is available on site for Ontario Place and for Exhibition plan. Place. Thank you. The next question, the member for Kiwetanon. Uh, speaker, uh, speaker uh, Niskandaga First Nation is coming on its uh, 30th year of, with the Boyo Water Advisory. Speaker, that is 10,641 days. Once again, uh, uh, tomorrow is a World Water Day. Uh, in the writing of Kiwet, I have uh, 14 First Nations that have Boyo Water Advisories. Speaker, uh, it is racism to do nothing. That's right. Next week's budget is an opportunity for change. Yes. Mr. Speaker, I ask, uh, will, there be, will, will there be any allocations for money to lifting boil water advisories on reserves? <laughs> Government House Leader. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate the question from the member opposite. Uh, uh, look, I can't uh, uh, confirm anything that will be in the budget. The member will have to wait until uh, uh, next uh, Tuesday uh, for the, uh, the details of the budget. At the same time, I know that uh, uh, the minister has continued to work uh, very closely with uh, our federal partners. Uh, as you know, Mr. Speaker, the, uh, the federal government made a commitment uh, uh, to First Nations back in uh, 2015 that they would provide the necessary funding to remove all boil water advisories across uh, the country. Uh, that is a promise that has still not been kept by the federal government. We will continue to hold their feet to, uh, to the fire to make sure that we can get uh, this, uh, this promise, uh, 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 not only for First Nations, frankly, uh, across the province of Ontario, but I think all First Nations across the country who were, who were uh, relying on the federal government to live up to this promise back in 2015. Response. Okay, the supplementary question, the member for Hamilton West and Custer Dundas. Uh, speaker, tomorrow is World Water Day, March 22nd, and we have many people here in the gallery who have traveled from the Lake Simcoe area. They, along with the Chippewas of Georgina Island, are very concerned with the health of this beloved lake. We have a majority government. There are five Lake Simcoe area Conservative MPPs, including the Minister of the Environment, in this area. There's existing legislation dating back to 2008, and yet we have seen no action in cleaning up the phosphorus issues in Lake Simcoe. This budget, the Conservative budget, is coming next week. Will the Premier finally adequately, adequately fund the Lake Simcoe Protection Plan, yes or no? Members will please take their seats. To reply, Minister of Environment, Conservation and Parks. Uh, thank you, Speaker. I, I really welcome the members' interest in this file. This government has been interested in protecting Lake Simcoe from day one. Uh, for instance, uh, there was this historic project to take five tons of phosphorus per year out of the Holland Marsh, which, thanks to the actions of this Premier and this government, a project that was on the books for decades that wasn't getting done, this government is getting done. And work, Speaker. And work is already underway, Speaker. This is a great project for the watershed, a great project for the jewel of Lake Simcoe. This builds on the millions of dollars of investments in the lake to date. We're working with partners like the Lake Simcoe Conservation Authority, the, uh, the St. Lawrence River Institute, amongst many other partners in terms of Response. reducing chloride levels, reducing phosphorus, and making sure that we have a great state-of-the-art lake for, state, for generations to come. Here, here. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Essex. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Energy. Constituents in my riding are telling me that they can't afford the Liberal carbon tax. 
And the last thing they need is another Liberal carbon tax. Order. Mr. Speaker. Order. The Liberal members of, the, of this legislature, Order. under the leader of the Queen of the Carbon Tax, won't stand with us when we try to fight the carbon tax. They won't stand with us. And they're happy to raise your taxes every year under the Liberal leader, the Queen of the Carbon Tax. Mm. Only the PC government is trying to make life more affordable, affordable for the people in the province of Ontario. And only the PC government is fighting the Liberal carbon tax. Question. Speaker, can the minister please tell this House why it's time to scrap the carbon tax? Let us go. The Minister of Energy. Thanks to the member from Essex who's doing an outstanding job representing his residents in southwestern Ontario, where we're actually seeing growth happen at a record pace, uh, Mr. Speaker, and that's in spite of the regressive carbon tax that's being imposed on the people of Ontario and the people of Canada by the federal Liberal Order. government. Now, the member of the Liberal Party is saying, well, you opened the door for this by getting rid Order. of the cap and trade. We campaigned in 2018, Mr. Speaker, to cap taxes and to trade Kathleen Wynne. And we were very, very successful in doing that, Mr. Speaker, with a massive majority government and then won another one four years later. And as a result, we went from being the most uncompetitive jurisdiction in North America in the eyes of the global auto sector to a jurisdiction that is now seeing multi-billion dollar investments like Response. ones in Essex and in Windsor, ones in St. Thomas, in Loyalist Township, and right across Ontario. In spite of this regressive tax, we've been able to return Ontario to its rightful place as the Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Supplementary question. I thank the minister for that excellent response and for his continuing fight against the carbon tax. While our government has remained laser-focused on trying to keep costs down, the Liberals and the NDP continue working against us. Under the leadership of the Queen of the Carbon Tax, the Liberals in this House continue to try to block us in our fight against the carbon tax. Order. They vote against us every time. And as the federal Liberals continue reaching into the pockets of taxpayers with more and more tax hikes, we need the opposition parties, the Liberals and the NDP, to help us fight the carbon tax. Speaker, can the minister please explain why Ontario Question. families simply cannot afford this unfair carbon tax imposed upon us by the Queen of the Carp. Minister of Energy. Well, uh, absolutely, I can, uh, Mr. Speaker. You know, it's it's unbelievable at a time when people are worried about the cost of living in our province, and we're in the midst of an affordability crisis across the country, Order. Mr. Speaker, that a government at the federal level would decide in about 10 days' time to increase taxes again. This carbon tax is about to go up by a staggering 23 per cent on April 1st. And again, that's no joke. And the queen of the carbon tax, the leader of the Liberal Party of Ontario, is hand-in-hand hand with Justin Trudeau, championing this increase when the people of Ontario and the people of Canada are hurting, Mr. Speaker. We disagree. We disagree wholeheartedly with this approach by the federal government. We have capped taxes. We've reduced taxes. We've eliminated fees. We brought in things like one fare in our transit system across the greater Toronto area that's going to save people $1,600 a year. This is what a responsible government should be doing, working for the people, not against Thank you. The next question, the member for Niagara Falls. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, we recently learned that nearly 300 seniors in Ontario have been moved from hospitals to long-term care homes that they didn't choose. Shame. Under Bill 7, patients can be sent to a long-term care facility up to 150 kilometres away from their homes without their consent or be charged $400 a day if they refuse. These are our moms, our dads, our grandparents, our aunts, our uncles, the people who built this great province. Speaker, 
Why is this government choosing to force almost 300 vulnerable seniors to be moved without their consent away from their homes and their families? Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker. So by the same number, Speaker, what the member is saying is 17,000 337 seniors went from being ALC patients in hospital to being residents in long-term care. <laughs> Speaker, that's 17,000 more beds in hospitals for more acute care. That's 17,000 seniors who get to call a home a home because it is this government that is investing into these homes, not just by building more capacity, but making sure that they have a level of comfort that they deserve. Speaker. Now, the members are chirping, and maybe they, they, they're chirping is because they're angry that for the better part of two decades, while they supported the Liberals, they built nothing. They built 611 net new beds during that time. They failed to invest into our health human resources. Response. They failed to invest into the capacity. Speaker, in short, they failed our seniors. We're learning something there. Thank you. The supplementary question, back to the member from Niagara Falls. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the Premier. Speaker, this is part of a pattern of disrespect to the, from this government as shown to our seniors. And as that minister stands up and talks about people leaving our hospital, let's talk. Let's not forget about the 6,000 seniors that lost their lives during COVID, and the government is responsible was, is now taking them away from their families' ability to have a home accountable. This government has given away license extensions. Think about this to the very same private for-profit homes where the military, the Canadian military, had to be called in to save these residents from dehydration. They then passed Bill 7 without holding public hearings, preventing families from com commenting on the devastating impacts of this legislation. This government refuses to treat seniors and long-term care residents with the respect and dignity they deserve. Speaker, will this government repeal Bill 7, apologize to those 300 families, and finally show the seniors the respect they deserve and have earned in the province of Ontario? So please take their seats. Minister of Long-Term Care. Speaker, you want to talk about disrespect? This government had been here for a year and a half. They had the better part of two decades when the COVID that pandemic had hit. And what did they do during that time? Did they invest? Were they that Order. passionate? Were they asking questions Order. in this legislature about what the Liberals were doing to improve the quality of life for our seniors? No, Speaker, they weren't doing that. Guess what? This morning, the cameras must be on because Order. the member stands in his place and he claims to be a defender of seniors. But in his own writing, Oakwood Manor, Crescent Manor, Radiant Care, Pleasant Manor, long-term care, it's a long list and thousands of beds. The member votes against building beds in his own riding, against supports for beds in his own riding. Speaker, you want to give an apology? You should apologize to the seniors in this province for not protecting them before the pandemic hit. Stop the call. <laughs> Members will please take their seats. And once again, Order. Order. Read the book. Order. The House will come to order. Six. And once again, I will remind members to make their comments through the chair. Order. Start the clock. Next question, the member for Sault Ste. Marie. Thank you, uh, thank you, Speaker. Uh, I can see the minister is very angry, and you know there's there's a lot of reasons to be angry when you think about the Liberals, uh, especially the federal Liberals. And you know something I'm angry about, Speaker, and people of my community are equally angry about it. And it's the federal carbon tax, Speaker. It's leading uh, to soaring fuel Order. prices, making it unaffordable for everyone. 
tough to even drive a car, Speaker. Uh, people have to think twice about driving a car in my riding now and, and ridings across northern Order. Ontario. It's unfair to every driver in this province, especially those in the north who rely very heavily on their vehicles just so that they can go to work every day, run errands, take their kids to soccer practice. All of these things are just too expensive because of the federal Liberals and their provincial counterparts who refuse to change this awful position on the carbon tax and are constantly hurting northern communities. Speaker. We continue to take leadership on addressing affordability in this province to help the North get the help it deserves. Speaker, can the Minister of Transportation please tell us how the carbon tax is hurting northern Ontario communities with this regressive, terrible tax? Minister of Transportation. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The member is absolutely right. And when we look at the North, the challenges are even more significant when it comes to the carbon tax, Mr. Speaker. But it's no surprise that the Liberals and the NDP are not listening to the people. They're out of touch, Mr. Speaker. Just a couple of weeks ago, it was a federal Liberal environment minister who is now trying to impose this 23 percent increase of carbon taxes on the people of the North and across Canada, and especially in Ontario. The, he was the one who said, no more roads. Canada doesn't need any more roads, Mr. Speaker. That, wow. How out of touch can you be, Mr. Speaker? But on top of that, now they want to increase their carbon tax by 23 percent, Mr. Speaker. That's a tax on food. That's a tax on groceries. It's a tax on fuel, Mr. Speaker, on energy, on heating your home. People cannot afford it. And I hope that the provincial Liberals and the NDP step up right to the federal government and tell them to scrap the tax. Yeah. Supplementary question. Well, well, Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the uh, minister for his response. And uh, you know, it, it's obvious, Mr. Speaker, our government continues to advocate for all of Ontarians. We continue to advocate for really everyone around this country when it comes to the far-reaching negative effects and impacts of this terrible tax, the carbon tax, the federal carbon tax, a tax that the opposition parties, especially the Liberals across the aisle, they want to support that. And they think it's a great idea that we're going to nearly triple this tax. It's unacceptable, Speaker. It's, it's breaking the backs of common, hardworking Ontarians, Northern Ontarians, and, and the Liberals across the aisle, they just want to sit silent, Mr. Speaker. You know, I guess it's because their leader is one of the only Liberals left in the entire country of Canada who will not speak out against this terrible carbon tax and the, the additional nearly Question. triple, triple again. They want to increase it. Speaker, can the minister please explain to us how this negative tax is hurting the people of our province? Minister of Transportation. Send him a direct message. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Let's just take the North for example on this. We know that long haul truck drivers under the current scheme, it costs them almost fifteen to twenty thousand dollars because of that carbon tax. Jumping, now what does that mean, especially for the North, Mr. Speaker, when you're taking truckloads of food, groceries, um, medicine? And now imposing a 23 percent increase on top of that for the carbon tax, Mr. Speaker, Shock. this is going to hurt not only truckers, Mr. Speaker, who are out fifteen to twenty thousand dollars that they could use that money to support their families, put their kids through school, put their kids um, in an extracurricular activity, but think of the people in the north, how much their food is going to increase, Mr. Speaker, because that food travels on trucks, Mr. Speaker. A 23 percent increase being proposed by the federal government. It's unbelievable. And what's more shameful is, Mr. Speaker, the provincial Liberals and the NDP are doing nothing to advocate to stop the carbon tax from going up 23 percent, Mr. Speaker, under leadership of people. The next question, the member for Ottawa West Nepean. Thank you, Speaker. The government's underfunding of education has led to an explosion in the use of portables at Ontario schools. This Band-Aid solution has become so widespread that new schools are opening with portables already in the yard. <laughs> Parents and teachers have raised concerns about the conditions in portables. Mold, poor ventilation, heating problems, the lack of bathrooms. Does the Minister of Education share these concerns, and will he provide adequate funding for school construction and repairs so that portables can go back to being a temporary fix instead of a permanent fixture? Minister of Education. 
Uh, thank you, Speaker. I thank the member opposite for the question. I think one thing you, that her and I could agree with is that the former government left a profoundly devastating impact after closing 600 schools in rural Ontario. Unacceptable, and families paid the price. And in sharp contrast to their dereliction of duty, the Premier and our party has invested over $15 billion over a decade to build net new schools. And Mr. Speaker, I'm proud to report 100 schools are being built as we speak, 200 more in the pipeline. We have invested every single budget to invest over $550 million to build schools. Ten, literally thousands of additional spaces have been created, as well as thousands of additional childcare spaces within schools. We're committed to going in for even further, Speaker, which is why in December we announced a plan to slash construction timelines by half to build faster and smarter and get the job done for growing communities Spons. across Spons. And this supplementary question. It really is amazing, Speaker, how this government has been in power for six years, yet all these portables and schoolyards are apparently not their responsibility. The conditions in portables aren't just about health and safety. They also affect learning outcomes. Research shows that the more portables a school has, the lower its test scores in math, reading and writing. If the minister really wants to boost test scores in Ontario, he should increase capital funding so that schools no longer need to use portables. Will we see an increase in next week's budget, Speaker, or is the minister's back to basic commitment all talk? Minister of Education. Mr. Speaker, after signing deals with all teacher unions providing stability for three years, an achievement that has not been done in nearly a generation under any party and any government, we have, yes, committed to increasing investments, as we've done every single year in publicly funded schools. Because, Speaker, under our Premier's leadership, we are investing more in publicly funded schools than any government in the history of this province. A meaningful commitment. And it's not just about the money, Speaker, because, yes, we've hired 3,000 more teachers, 7,500 more additional education workers. It's not just about the money. It's about getting value for dollars. It's why we passed the Better Schools and Student Outcomes Act yep. to elevate our standards and demand better for the people we represent. Back to Basics is more than a hashtag. It is a focus on foundational learning, on reading, writing, and math, and STEM disciplines. And I would hope the members opposite wouldn't trivialize the necessity of building the skills to ensure every child succeeds, owns a home, gets a good job, and achieves the promise of this country. Yep. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Kingston and the Islands. Uh, Mr. Speaker, this morning, the Premier showed his true colours when it comes to building affordable housing. This Premier doesn't care about getting people housed in homes they can afford. Just this morning, while standing in front of massive single-family homes that the majority of Ontarians can't even dream of affording, he completely ruled out allowing four units as of right in communities across the province. Such units would supply more housing to families, renters, students, downsizing seniors, and anyone else struggling to find an affordable place to live in their community. After today's revelations, will the Premier finally admit that he doesn't actually care about building affordable housing? The Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Listen, uh, it, it's clear to me that the, the Liberals still have not caught on, right? This is coming from uh, a party whose leader had the amazing uh, uh, responsibility of building homes but saw the population of her community under her leadership actually decline. She, she really knocked it out of the park with those two housing starts that she had in the months that she left office, right? Two housing starts. Not only did she not even come close to meeting her target, she actually saw people fleeing her jurisdiction. The only reason that Mississauga is doing as well as they are is because the members of provincial parliament from this caucus, who have been focused on jobs and economic growth, bringing investments to that community, Mr. Speaker, we have been bringing forward measures to help build housing supply across the province of Ontario. It has become increasingly clear to us, working with our municipal Bots. partners, that the thing that they want is for us to get out of the way, help them get infrastructure in the ground. Today's announcement will do just that, Mr. Speaker. We'll put infrastructure in the ground and homes will be built. The supplementary question. Well, Minister, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, the Minister might want to look at uh, a city that elected a Liberal member, the city of Kingston, that's leading the tables in building housing. 
Ontario Liberals want to treat housing affordability like the crisis it really is for so many people in Ontario. That's why we want to allow four units as of right province-wide. We believe this is a crisis. People across the province feel the pain. The Conservatives are just pre pretending to be worried. We must, and the people expect us, to build housing differently, with mixed neighbourhoods and gentle density while preserving green spaces. And Many of the answers are right under the Premier's nose in his own Order. task force report, like four units as of right, province-wide. Through you, Speaker. Premier, why are you giving up? Why can't the people of Ontario Question. count on you to believe we're facing a housing affordability crisis? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Reality. The former leader of the Liberal Party came in front of a committee that this House uh, had brought forward and said that the housing crisis started under the previous Liberal government. You know why? Because of red tape, Mr. Speaker, because of high costs, Mr. Speaker, that stifled the ability to build more homes. And now we're seeing the exact same thing, Mr. Speaker. They're supporting high interest rates because of their federal cousins, high interest rates which are making it impossible to build more homes and puts many people, thousands of people, out of the market for those new homes, Mr. Speaker. Working with our municipal partners, we have heard one thing over and over and over and over again. The infrastructure deficit that was left behind by the previous Liberal government is stopping them from building the hundreds, the millions Order. of homes that are needed, Mr. Response. Speaker. So while we will continue to work with our municipal partners, we'll actually give them the tools that they need to build not hundreds of homes, but millions of homes, and that's what today's Thank you. The next question, the member for Brantford Brant. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Mines. Let me guess. There is no better place to invest and do business than right here in Ontario, and that is why um, we are continuing our efforts to secure the supply chain for critical minerals with no help from the opposition NDP and the independent Liberals. For 15 <laughs> years, the previous Liberal government, supported every day by the NDP, did nothing to unlock the generation Order. of critical minerals potential Order. in the Ring of Fire region. Order. In fact, the opposition continues to, to say yes to the carbon tax that only harms this critical sector while voting against any measure that makes opposition come to order for the people in northern ontario speaker that's unacceptable Question. our government must continue to support responsible development that will create jobs across the entire province including northern and indigenous communities speaker can the minister please explain what actions our government is taking to build a corridor to prosperity in partnership. Minister of Mines can reply. Well, Speaker, thank you to the member from Brantford Brant for the question. During the PDAC mining conference this year, I signed a community development agreement with the Chiefs of Martin Falls First Nation and Webeke First Nation. This agreement is part of our $1 billion investment to build a corridor to prosperity that will connect First Nations partners to the road network and bring growth and prosperity to the region. I will support shovel-ready infrastructure projects that will, support, that will improve the well-being and readiness of First Nation partners, getting us one step closer to building the roads to the Ring of Fire. I, will commend, I want to commend Chief Bruce and Chief Cornelius for their vision and commitment to building stronger communities and thank them for their dedication to moving these projects forward. I look forward to strengthening our partnership as we Spons. take the next steps together. I am honoured to be associated with these two leaders. Here, here. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for that response. Speaker, people in Northern Ontario are struggling to afford basic needs as a result of the federal carbon tax. And that's why I am so proud to be part of a government that, unlike the NDP and the Liberals, is finding ways to create jobs and bring prosperity for everyone across this entire province. Here, here. And, Speaker, that is exactly what the Community Development Agreement will accomplish. It commits Ontario to supporting shovel-ready infrastructure projects to help each First Nation prepare for future economic development opportunities such as road construction and mining development. Speaker, 
Can the minister pr please provide the House with further details on the agreement with Martin Falls First Nation and with Webekwe First Nation? Thank you. Minister of Mines. Mr. Speaker, Webekwe and Martin First <coughs> Falls First Nations will choose projects that meet their specific needs so that they are ready to for the exciting economic opportunities these roads and mining will create. Projects like new health and training facilities, recreation centres, community centres and labour force development programs are all eligible for funding. We also agreed to make decisions together on construction ownership and governance of the roads so we can improve project timelines. We can't wait for the EAs to be finished. We must act with urgency. Working together, we will create an unprecedented era of prosperity that will secure a better future for the next generations. That is what these projects are all about. I know the community development agreement we reached will help us to work together to prepare a future that is connected by roads and a future Response. that unlocks the area for mining that the, the previous governments neglected. We are getting it done. Good job, Jake. Thank you. The next question, the member for St. Catharines. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Infrastructure. Since 1995, A Child's World has provided affordable childcare for the Niagara region. They have a rental space from this Ontario government, and your ministry has just informed them that their rent is going up by 160000 That's a 1,300% increase. Oh. This is going to shut down this centre, and these parents can't lose their childcare spaces that they depend on. Why is this Conservative government raising the rent? And to reply, the Minister of Infrastructure. Very much what this government did was land a childcare deal that benefits families across the province of Ontario, which also includes building 86,000 additional childcare spaces, mm. Mr. Speaker. I know because my very own constituents are benefiting from the work that the Minister of Education has done on this file. That being said, Mr. Speaker, I'm happy to take her request back and look into, look into it further. Uh, thank the member for raising the issue. Thank you. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the Minister. Minister, you could have saved these childcare spots today if you weren't putting profits over the parents and their children of Niagara. These federal childcare dollars need to be going to childcare, not to profit your government. Minister, will you direct your staff to overturn this decision, reverse this 1,300% rent hike today? Now, for the 44 childcare spaces that are going to be lost. Good question. Minister of Infrastructure. Be happy to speak to the ways that we are supporting the good, hardworking people of Niagara. We are building two hospitals in the region, Mr. Speaker. Order. We're building the West Lincoln. Order. Memorial Hospital, which is under construction, as well as the new uh, Niagara South Hospital. And this is in addition to transit expansion. Order through other means uh, other investments through the investing in canada infrastructure programs such as the peach king community center but again to the member opposite i'm happy to take back her comments and look into them further thank you the next question the next question the member for richmond hill thank you mr speaker my question is for the Associate Minister of Transportation. Constituents in my riding of Richmond Hill are becoming increasingly concerned about the carbon tax and the impact it has on their household budgets. As the prices of food, gas and transportation continue to rise, the federal government is choosing to ignore the hardship of Ontarians go through. The NTP and the Liberals are like their friends in Ottawa. They are supporting this costly tax rather than standing with us. Right. Unlike the members opposite, our government is fighting this tax to ensure that we are delivering more affordability and more financial relief for the people of Ontario. Speaker, can the Associate Minister please tell the House what action our government is taking to combat this dreadful carbon tax? Thank you. To reply, 
the Associate Minister of Transportation. Thank you to the member from Richmond Hill for that question. Mr. Speaker, on April 1st, the federal Liberal government, supported by the Ontario Liberals, is increasing the carbon tax, which will hurt Ontario families and make life more unaffordable, Mr. Speaker. We recognize the people of Ontario need a break now more than ever, Mr. Speaker. Under the leadership of Premier Ford, we have been proactive in cost cutting in every measures we can, Mr. Speaker. We have introduced one fare that's saving $1,600 every year. We got rid of fees to renew license plate, Mr. Speaker, saving drivers over $2.2 billion, Mr. Speaker, and we reduced the gas tax by 10 cents per litre, Mr. Speaker. At every turn, the opposition Response. continue to vote against making life more affordable for the people of Ontario, while our government is doing everything we can to respect the hard-earned money of the people of Ontario, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Thank you. And supplementary, back to the member for Richmond Hill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Associate Minister for his response. The carbon tax is leading to soaring fuel prices that make it difficult for everyone in our province. Mr. Speaker, the federal Liberals and the provincial counterparts continue to turn a blind eye to Ontarians' struggles. Our government cannot let this costly carbon tax continue to affect our businesses, economy and Ontario workers. We must continue to make them more affordable and make life more affordable and put more money back in people's pockets where it belongs. Speaker, can the Associate Minister of Transportation please explain how our government is ensuring that Ontarians are receiving the support they need as we fight the carbon tax? The Associate Minister of Transportation. Thank you to the member from Richmond Hill for her advocacy. Mr. Speaker, this carbon tax is a heavy load for Canadians. It's making everyday things like driving to work, getting groceries more expensive, Mr. Speaker. Order. A tax that cripples industry and sends jobs overseas is not a step forward. It's a giant leap backward for the working people of Ontario, Mr. Speaker. The federal Liberals is ruining the lives and destroying small business across the province, Mr. Speaker. The Ontario Liberals and NDP let us all Order. down by not showing up for the fight that really matters for the people of Ontario. Mr. Speaker, yeah, our yeah, government yeah, yeah. and millions of Ontarians across this province are calling on the federal government to stop playing games yeah. and axe the tax, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. Our message is clear. We will fight. Order. The next question, the member for Toronto St. Paul's. Thank you, Speaker. Ontario's arts and culture sector represents over $28 billion, approximately 3.5 per cent of the province's GDP, and creates some 300,000 jobs and counting. There is no question that this sector is an economic engine that will only grow and remain competitive with real, sustainable government investment. We are hearing from theatre companies, culture, heritage, arts organizations, individual artists, cultural workers and festivals. For many, the costs are skyrocketing, Speaker. Costs for insurance, security, venue rentals, staffing and labour, even production costs. Uh, softwood lumber, I've learned, has gone up hundreds of percents over the years uh, due to, you know, uh, due to due, due to the closures of Millwood. Question. My question is to the Premier. For the love of arts, will this government stop gutting the Ontario Arts Council and Experience Ontario so the curtains don't close in our culture sector? Thank you. Members, will please take their seats. Mr. Tourism, Culture and Sport. Speaker, <clears throat> excuse me, and, and thank you for the question. Um, and I know the member understands completely what culture and the arts means to all of us in all of our communities. Um, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, we can look at culture, we can look at tourism, and, and there are a lot of elements that it touches and touches us all in a very positive way, from an investment to an impact to our communities and our province. Um, 
Through the Ontario Arts Council, our investment of $60 million goes a long way in supporting a lot of the cultural pieces within our province. We have had those that have struggled in the last little while, and I'm proud to say that our ministry has met with them and talked and see if we can help them find their way. A lot need to, are talking about restructuring, a lot are looking outside of other opportunities, understanding that the government Spons. is there for them in the right way, but not only the government is there, that they have to go out and find their way, and they're willing to do it, and they're passionate about doing the same. Here, here. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, OAC funding has pretty much stayed the same for several years. Inflation has gone up. That equates to a cut to Ontario Arts Council funding and a cut to our artists and our cultural institutions across the province. My question is back to the Premier. This government referred to the culture sector as the first hit, hardest hit, and last to recover during the pandemic. Remember that. In my community, RastaFest organizers are worried, especially in Little Jamaica, where festivals like Sinting also saw zero investment from this province. The Toronto Caribbean Carnival, the largest festival in North America, annually contributing nearly half a billion dollars to Ontario's GDP and creating 4,000 direct jobs, is asking for $2.5 million annually for the next three years so they can keep their heads above water. Just for laughs, hot dogs, taste of the Danforth, home county music and art festival in London, super crawl, and more need real sustainable help. Speaker, my question is back to the Premier. Does this government have a provincial culture strategy with teeth, with dollars, to help create creative industries, keep their lights? Question. And if not, why not? Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, Let's look at some of those teeth. Uh, $2.6 million to hot dogs over the last five years. We met with them recently, exactly the date was March 5th. We've talked to them about how we can help them, how we can help them. We're looking into their business model, their plan. Experience Ontario covers this province with great support. $19.5 million supports community events and festivals, Mr. Speaker. All of our communities and all those events and festivals and the people in and around those events and festivals are helping build business and community and confidence in what they do. We are there to support them. We are happy to support them, and we will continue to do that. And we are happy again to sit down Order. with Caravan as we did this past week and talk to them about their business plan and their model moving forward. Thank you for putting the number on the table because in our conversations they didn't mention 2.5. But thanks for the thank you. And the next question, the member for Simcoe Gray. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question this morning is for the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. The hardworking people of Simcoe Gray and across Ontario are being punished by the regressive federal carbon tax speaker. The tax is forcing individuals and families who are already struggling in these challenging times to stretch their hard-earned incomes like never before. As the Parliamentary Budget Officer found, the Federal Liberals' Carbon Tax Rebate Program is not providing residents in rural communities with the relief that they were promised. Speaker, this is not fair and it is not acceptable. Our government, under Premier Ford, will continue to stand up for the residents of Simcoe Gray in rural Ontario and call on the federal government to end this punitive tax. Here, here. Speaker, can the minister please tell this House why the federal carbon tax is failing and its failing rebate program are disproportionately affecting the residents of rural Ontario. Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I, I truly appreciate the question from this amazing member from Simcoe Gray because he totally has nailed it. There's inequities happening across the board because of this failed ideology that has driven Liberal policy to make the cost of everything go sky high. For instance, Speaker, in, in the spirit of inequities in rural Ontario and across Ontario, the entire province, I should say, 70 per cent of people require heating through natural gas. In some instances, like in northern Ontario and on our farm, we use propane. And furthermore, we have to take a look at what's happening in rural Ontario. With the increase of carbon tax happening as of April 1st, we are going to have more stress and pressure 
on all of our systems. For instance, in rural Ontario, we have transit mobility initiatives, but the cost of those buses traveling from town to town is going to go nowhere else. School buses, ambulances, even getting our mail delivered in our rural routes across the province is going to go sky Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Supplementary, the member for Simcoe Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for a response. The carbon tax is harming the hardworking individuals, businesses, and farmers of Simcoe Gray and areas across our province. We know Ontario has one of the cleanest electrical grids in Canada. Speaker, we also know that Ontario has reduced its greenhouse gas emissions by 27 per cent as compared to 2005 levels. That is 90 per cent of the way of our target, Mr. Speaker. We are leading Canada. The fact is that the tax is taking money from families for no good reason. On top of that, Speaker, the federal government is selectively exempting home heating oil from the carbon tax. They are sending the message that not everyone is treated equally across this country. Again, this is unfair and it's unacceptable. As we continue to face an affordability crisis, our government must continue to fight the carbon tax and provide Ontario families with the financial relief they need. Speaker, can the minister Shit. please explain why the federal carbon tax is costly and unfair to the people of Ontario? Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Thank you very much, and uh, I appreciate the opportunity to point out the fact that it's our government, under the leadership of Premier Ford, with the support of our finance minister, we have done so much to reduce the cost of living. For instance, one of the single largest tax cuts in Ontario history is what we did with gas. We reduced the cost of gas by 10.7 cents a litre. Wow. But guess what, Speaker? As of April 1st, as of April 1st, carbon tax is going to make the cost of everything go up 23 per cent, and that's what's unfair. And we have to fight against it every step of the way. The federal Liberals and the provincial Liberals need to stand up, take responsibility, and actually do what we're telling them to do. Scrap the tax. Because guess what? Response. I would project, as of April 1st, Speaker, we're going to see uh, Bonnie Crombie uh, go on another fundraising sp uh, uh, spree because she needs to raise money to fuel her, her ban to get the— Thank you very much. Thank you. The next question, the member for London North Centre. Thank you, Speaker. Good morning. My question is to the Premier. The official opposition leader and London MPPs recently toured the Nazem Qadri Surgical Centre, a brilliant, first-of-its-kind outpatient clinic which deals with low-intensity, low-risk procedures in a high-quality interdisciplinary environment. It's an ingenious, cost-effective way to help patients quickly while alleviating the burden on our precious healthcare system. Public funding and public delivery, the best bang for your buck. Exactly. To our surprise, we learned that the Premier and Minister of Health also visited the centre and said this was a model to replicate. We agreed. So why aren't they? The Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. You finally had an opportunity to tour the centre. We actually did that uh, many months ago and have subsequent conversations with the leadership within that uh, centre. It is a model of care that, of course, was funded. Uh, through our innovative uh, program that allowed and ensured hospitals had access to infrastructure to make sure that they could provide additional surgeries and deal with the backlog that we were dealing with post-COVID. Um, it is a wonderful model, and they've been doing exceptional work in London uh, with the hospital and with the community, and I, ha I am happy to continue to have those conversations, as we have been doing for many months, to see what parts of those programs can we duplicate in other centres across Ontario? And the supplementary question. Back to the Premier, but just to clarify for the Minister, they self-funded and they came up with the concept, so I don't think it's appropriate that the Minister takes credit for it. The surgical centre operates at half the cost of hospital ORs. They literally double the output, meaning twice as many happy, healthy patients. Yet this government is prioritizing spending on for-profit surgery clinics and agency nursing companies which bleed the government dry. Why? Minister of Health. I want 
everyone to understand what the member opposite just said. Surgical centres that operate outside of hospitals are working and should be replicated throughout Ontario. There are many examples of, of individual surgery centers that are happening, whether it is through our cataract surgeries or particular orthopedic surgeries that happen outside of a hospital center. The one in Ottawa is a beautiful example, and we have others operating within the province of Ontario. But I hope that the member opposite remembers that question when we vote on expansion of independent integrated surgical and diagnostic centers in Ontario. Thank you. The next question, the member for Newmarket, Aurora. Thank you, Speaker. And my question is for the Minister of Long-Term Care. The federal carbon tax is making life more challenging for Ontario families. When I was door knocking last week in my great riding of Newmarket, Aurora, the top issue I heard from residents was how the carbon tax was adding further strain on their household budgets. They know that the hike, this coming hike, will drive these costs even higher, and they are concerned about the impact it will have on them and their loved ones. Speaker, we know that the cost of building long-term care homes remains high, but the carbon tax is making it even higher. Our government must continue Question. to uphold our commitment to support seniors in Ontario. Speaker, can the minister explain what our government is doing to ensure that our seniors get the care they deserve while fighting this carbon tax every step oh of the God. way? Good. Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker. You know, this may be the first time I'm sitting closer to the floor than the superfan up there, but whether you're here, in his seat, or in one of the long-term care homes across the province, there is one fact that remains. The Liberal tax is making everything more expensive, and it's going to get higher. That's no joke on April 1st. It's a tax on the very operation of our long-term care homes, just like how it costs more to heat our homes. It costs more to heat their homes. That's, right. That's one reason our government is continuing to make historic investments into long-term care. And unlike the Liberals, we understand that rising costs hurt Response? everyone, especially our most vulnerable. And unlike the previous Liberal government that drove up the price of hydro, and unlike the federal Liberals that keep driving up the cost of heating, we're fighting to keep costs low. That includes our great seniors in long-term care. Well Thank you. That concludes our question period for this morning. And uh, I recognize the member first, I guess, the member for Mississauga Malton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's an absolute pleasure to introduce my good friend Raj Khanna Rinku Kai and a person who needs no introduction. We are all fan of him, super fan Nav Bhatia. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Member for Windsor to come see has informed me he has a point of order as well. I wanted to uh, welcome uh, the family of Paige Sarah Penner, who are here uh, at the, the gallery. Garth Penner, Bridget Haw, Megan Haw, Tegan Haw, and Harrison Haw. Welcome to Greens Park. I recognize the member for Peterborough Kawartha on a point of order. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I just wanted to wish a happy 56th birthday to my big brother, Jeff Smith. <laughs> Thank you. I recognize the government house leader under standing order 59. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, and thank you uh, to our colleagues for a very productive week uh, for the people of Ontario. Uh, Monday, March 25th, uh, we will have uh, opposition day uh, number three uh, in the afternoon, uh, followed by uh, third reading of Bill 31, uh, the Murray Way 10 Community Service Award, uh, in the name of the member for Peterborough Kawartha. Uh, uh, in the morning of uh, March 26th, depending on how uh, uh, business unfolds on uh, Monday, March 25th. We will either continue on that 
uh, or we will uh, not be in sitting, but we'll have more information on that uh, in, uh, on Monday, Monday afternoon. Uh, as you know, uh, the budget will be presented uh, on Tuesday uh, afternoon uh, by uh, the Minister of Finance. But before that, uh, colleagues, uh, before question period, the House will pay tribute to our departed uh, former member, Mr. Daryl Cramp. On Wednesday, March uh, 27, uh, in the, both the morning and afternoon session are yet to be determined, and we will follow up with uh, House leaders in the evening on uh, um, private members' motion standing in the name of the member for Leeds, Grenville, Thousand Islands. Uh, motion number uh, 82. Uh, on Thursday, March 28, in the morning and in the afternoon, government notice of motion number 22 uh, will be debated, and in the evening there will be no private members' business on Thursday, March 28. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you very much. Pursuant to Standing Order 36A, the member for Niagara Falls has given notice of dissatisfaction with the answer to their question given by the Minister of Long-Term Care regarding long-term care. This matter will be debated on Wednesday following private members' public business. Next, we have a deferred vote on the motion for second reading of Bill 163, an act to amend the Residential Tenancies Act 2006. Call in the members. This is a five-minute bell. 